Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. This will be part 343, and today we're entering into a lesson we titled The Inheritance of the Saint. We've been talking about the mechanics of salvation, how the Father has designed the salvation experience to prepare <coughs> the saint from transitioned from transition from earth to heaven <coughs> and in this <coughs> particular aspect we want to take a look at the inheritance factor which is virtually the center focus of the saints transition scripture teaches from an infant the saint is to pursue the knowledge of his inheritance in eternity, which the spirit of wisdom and revelation will impart to him. Mm. Ephesians, the first chapter, <clears throat> verses 17 to 18. That the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, who is talking about the Father, the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. <coughs> Why? <coughs> the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So the spirit of wisdom and revelation gives us enlightenment, comprehension, understanding. <coughs> of our purpose mm -hmm. <clears throat> that ye may know <clears throat> that ye may know comprehend what is the hope of his calling in other words what we've been called to do <clears throat> and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints the comprehension of what the father as prepared for us to inherit as sons. <clears throat> and of course he goes on to talk about the power that's resident within <clears throat> us that will enable us to aspire to achieve these things. <clears throat> so he talks about the riches of the inheritance. Well, an individual can't know the riches of the inheritance if he doesn't know what the inheritance is. Yes. Details, <clears throat> how it's going to uh, be achieved. <clears throat> and the first thing that the Spirit, <clears throat> wisdom and revelation, will impart to the saint is that the inheritance is dual in nature. Turn to Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 16 to 17. <clears throat> Actually, we're going to go 15 to 17. Because this is introduces the spirit, which is the centerpiece of our comprehending the inheritance. <clears throat> we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So he's talking about the spirit of wisdom and revelation is the spirit that leads us to achieve the adoption. 
The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. We're children there also means sons. <coughs> Here again, Paul is talking about the totality of the awareness that comes from the Spirit. The mind that's focused on the Spirit, not on the senses, but on the Spirit within him. The first thing that he becomes aware of is that the Spirit will give him, in no uncertain terms, the understanding that he is a son of God. And <clears throat> as a son of God, an heir of God. If children are sons, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. <clears throat> so what he's referring to here is the dual nature of the inheritance. We have an inheritance in the Father. We have a joint inheritance in the Son, which is conditional. The inheritance in the Father <coughs> is, <clears throat> for the most part, not conditional, but yet again, there is a condition. Okay. And that condition is that the individual has to merit uh, a return. In other words, has to have elicited rewards to enter into his inheritance. Now, <clears throat> we see this. Now, just before you go into that. Yes. <clears throat> so I imagine we're talking about the talents in terms of uh, meriting his inheritance. To what degree must he merit? Because people will be thinking, well, how much have I got to do? And of course, you'll have others who will think, you know, how little must I do? Give us some, some background. That's that human area. thinking. The Holy Spirit won't give it to you in those no. terms. Okay. Well, so the person who thinks that, what do they expect to hear? A person who thinks that is going to get nothing because <laughs> he's thinking human. <laughs> he's outside the Spirit. The Spirit will impart to him desire mm. to do. And to the degree that you aspire to do, that's the predication of what you're going to receive right. as a reward. Right. So as we discussed last night, when people begin to see the fruits, it's a good way to describe it, of the Spirit operating in the saint, the, 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 the saint recognizes, you could say, at that point, that he's moving in the right direction, and he is welcome of his inheritance. Yes, <clears throat> he feels a confidence. Mm. But even before that, the desire is the thing that impels the saint to go forward in motion it depends upon <coughs> the degree of acceleration that yes. will return the degree of rewards yes. Yes. and the degree of acceleration is predicated off of the the, the, the intensity of the desire mm. <coughs> now we go go on with the re the, the the other part of it which is this is the inheritance in the father <coughs> but we also have an inheritance in the Son. And if children and heirs, heirs of God the Father, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, <clears throat> you may ask, what is the difference? What is the determining factor between just being limited to the inheritance of the Father and going into the joint inheritance with the Son. Again, desire. Mm. And the determination <clears throat> to pursue the desire to its fullest. You find this, this is what determines a believer from a disciple. Yes. It's what determines the disciple from an apostle. <clears throat> the desire to totally commit to the fullest will conclude in the position that the person is going to achieve in his inheritance. Now, what we find here, <coughs> Scripture teaches the Spirit will reveal to him, this is pertaining to the inheritance of the Father, <coughs> the Spirit will reveal to him that at death, if he has rewards coming to him, he will ascend to his estate in the heavens to enter into them <coughs> which are in the realms of light. Turn to Colossians, the first chapter, <coughs> verse 1. Colossians, the first chapter, verse 1. 
verse 12. Now this is all revelation knowledge that comes from the Spirit. giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. <clears throat> the medium of habitation, existence, in eternity is the realm of light, the element of light. Everything exists in terms of intensity of light. <clears throat> the lower strata heavens operated in a certain intensity of light, the higher the higher intensities. The individual <clears throat> enters into an understanding because he has the Holy Spirit <clears throat> giving his spirit understanding of spiritual truths. To the degree that he's open to receive them, they generate a desire. The Holy Spirit impresses you with a perception. It all starts off as a perception. That perception will trigger a desire. You want to know more about what you're perceiving. You're faced with a choice. Most Christians, 99.9% .9 of them will not pursue the perception to its conclusion. The problem that Christians have in organized religion is that they are not encouraged to pursue the Holy Spirit's impressing them with a perception. Mm. They will always, always try to achieve an acquiescence from their intellect before they will pursue the spiritual perception. So they don't recognize that this perception that they've been presented with is the move of the Holy Spirit. No. They think, no, no, really, they think it's the move of the enemy. No, yes, because they're never given understanding. Sure. The Holy Spirit, again, the mainline denominations, the Holy Spirit has been neutralized. Mm. And everything is coached in terms of the intellect. It's the intellect that has the newness of life. It's the intellect that's growing. It's the intellect that's going to be blessed. It's the intellect that's doing this, doing that, doing the other. Hence, you have no miracles. You have no spiritual growth. You have no spiritual understanding. Absolutely because you shut down the whole aspect of the new creation existence. Well, let's go on. <clears throat> so... We're looking at this in the sense of <clears throat> starting from ground zero in <clears throat> reaching a state in which the individual receives desire and acts upon that desire to pursue the desire to make it stronger and stronger and stronger until it reaches a state where it dominates the life. Organized religion is designed to kill it, it make it stillborn. Because organized religion operates off of the physical, not the spiritual. The intellectual, not the spiritual. <clears throat> Let's continue. So the Holy Spirit will reveal at death if the saint as rewards, he will ascend to his state in the heavens to enter into them and begin <coughs> his habitation. Turn to First Peter, first chapter, verse three to four.
Blessed be the God and Father. So here again, we see everything we're talking about deals with the inheritance in the Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. <clears throat> when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the first thing that He told Mary was, Go tell my brethren. They have been begotten because He had been begotten. It had given them the ability now to qualify for the adoption. Yes. Tell us the definition of begotten. To give birth to. You give birth to. Abraham begot Isaac. He gives birth to Isaac. He, he generates as Isaac as his son. Well, when Jesus is called the only begotten son, mm -hmm. that was for a period of time. No, that's forever. He'll always be the only begotten son. We just got begotten here adopted begotten sons. We will never be monogenesi because to be monogenesi means you have no beginning nor end. Hmm. Probably a good idea that I ask that question then, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So then that brings in the question at the point that we are fully adopted and have no beginning and no end, are we then? You won't be monogenesi. You'll be adopted. And as the adoption, you'll be equal to the monogenesi. But you will not be monogenesi. For the Father to declare us as monogenesi would it's be not, a lie. It's not possible. Okay. And He doesn't lie. That's why He uses the term adoption, which puts us on the equal plane, but it carries into understanding that you were one time a created being who now forgets his beginnings and is treated now as though you never had a beginning equal to the one who really didn't have a beginning. But the word begotten is used, just not yes. only. Begotten. begotten in the sense of <coughs> given sonship. Through the new birth. That distinguishes you from a servant. Sure. Yes. It says he begotten us again. Yeah. Uh, you have a counterpart in heaven. When the Father willed you from an angelic state to a son state, you got begotten. So Adam being created and well, created in the image of the Father, the word begotten cannot be applied to him. No. No, no Adam? Uh, no. Well, it, the, the reason for the question is because he carries the image of the Father. It's made in his image. Yeah, but as a created being. Sure. <clears throat> That's like saying white VH is begotten. No, he's yes, created yes, being. Yes, yes. I, I see the <laughs> foolishness of my, my question. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> no, the son will always be the one who carries. That's why he's always going to be the elder brother. <clears throat> but we are given equality as sons. The father looks at us the same way he looks at the Lord Jesus. Has the same love. Well, he has the same love now that he has for the Lord Jesus. Hang on one second. Georgia wants to ask you a question. Oh, sure. You're breaking up so much that I'm not sure what the word was that you were talking about. Motor something? Monogenesis. Oh, monogenesis. Not motor Venice. <laughs> not, the, not the DMV. It means Venice. only begotten son. We're talking, Say that again. I'm sorry. It means only begotten son. Jesus is the only begotten son. Tell her monogenesi since she can hear it clearly. <laughs> the word is monogenesi in the Greek. And we're talking about the difference between Jesus being a son and us being a son. We never become the only begotten. We become adopted sons because we are created. Jesus was never created. He always existed. <clears throat> and so his, his determination, his distinction is always going to be the only begotten. So there's never going to be another only begotten son. But there will be adopted right. sons that will be equal to the only begotten son. Because the Father is establishing us equally as sons in the same light as Jesus is a son. 
The only difference is that we are sons who had a beginning. Jesus never did have a beginning. Okay, we're in 1 Peter, the first chapter. And what we find, <coughs> verse 4, our inheritance became established at the resurrection of the Lord. At that time, our estates became available. So all the prototokos that existed in Jesus, in Jesus' time who died went to their estates because of his death, burial, and resurrection. Nobody ever again would go into the subterranean regions because now, because of the born-again experience, everything was prepared for them in the heavens. Yes? I'm sure this is a question that everybody has. What do saints who've passed away and are in their estates do between now and the rapture? How do they spend in, their time? In their estates, mm -hmm. commensurate with who they are going to be, elder, angel, they're bringing about an organization, a preparation for that time. Our life on earth is a preparation for that time. And life in heaven is going to be a continuation on a higher scale that for direction. that time. Right. So the implication is absorbing comprehension, teaching, providing understanding to who? To each other? To those on the <coughs> earth? The spirit to the saint. So the spirit, doesn't, the spirit doesn't stop teaching. preparing the saint okay. until the time of the glorification. So as we are in school, you could say they are in school. Yes. Well. Okay. Yes. This will continue. The only time you're going to get a deviation is at the beginning of sorrows. Mm. Remember, the beginning of sorrows connects the heavens and the earth. Yes. It generates the first phase that leads to the completion of the inheritance. <clears throat> but let's go on. Next principle. <clears throat> this all deals so far, we've been talking about the inheritance with the Father. Commensurate with the rewards that the saint has. Scripture indicates <clears throat> Those who qualify for the adoption will be called from their estates by the Lord to accompany Him back to earth at the time of the <coughs> glorification. 1 Thessalonians 4th chapter, verse 13 to 14. First Thessalonians fourth chapter. We're going to do thirteen to fifteen. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He's talking about the saints that have gone to their estates in the heavens that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, it doesn't mean that they're snoring in heaven, it means they're in a state of repose. <clears throat> sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So the ones who qualify for the glorification, not everybody, going to qualify. Those that have rewards but don't qualify are going to be called out of their estates. They're going to remain there. 
those who have qualified for the glorification are going to be called out of their estates. The Lord descends from Eperanios down through the heavens. The saints are called and they link up with him as a group and they come down to earth. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before them which are asleep. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. These saints that have died and qualified for the glorification are going to receive their glory before those that are alive. <clears throat> to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. So those that qualify <coughs> inherit the joint inheritance with Christ, which starts at the glorification. What does this mean? This means that you're going to have a split in the society of the heavens. Saints that are glorified because they qualified for the joint inheritance and saints that didn't. Hence, in eternity, this is why you have the new heavens and the new earth. The new heavens are going to be for those who dwell in the new heavens. The new earth are going to be for those, Israel, the <coughs> groups that only have salvation. Beyond the heavens, you're going to have the abode of those that inherit the joint inheritance with Christ. For instance, the next principle. Scripture teaches those who qualify for the adoption become kings and priests who dominate the events of of the tribulation era. Revelation 5, verse 10. Yes, indeed. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Again, word on there in the Greek is over the earth. So they take dominion over the creation either as a king or a priest. Which brings us to the next phase here. Scripture teaches the saint in this life in this life, once given the understanding of which group he falls under, king, ruler, or priest, teacher, is to develop his talents within the church community. In other words, the Holy Spirit will give him an office here. At least this is what God's design has been. To give the saint an office here which will prepare him for his position in eternity as king or priest. Turn to Rev uh, turn to First Corinthians, twelfth chapter, verse twenty-eight. God has sent some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. Anybody falling under these categories is going to be a priest. Yeah. Why? Because these are the revelation offices. Mm -hmm. These are always priests. Yes. It's not possible for an elder to be an apostle, uh, an apostle a prophet or a teacher. No, because he couldn't be prepared to be an elder right. in these offices. These are offices that connect to the Spirit as revelation knowledge 
as intercessors, as teachers. They are given the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of Him. Uh, we're going to come back to this, but turn to Revelation 22. Just before, just before you turn to Revelation 24. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll probably do it later. Give us a difference, please, with the apostles and prophets here and those apostles and prophets who will be the elders leading the church at the gathering. Uh, well, the apostles and prophets that are going to be leading the church at the gathering are going to be basically taken from those that are set under the teachers. But they're elders is the point I'm making. No, I'm not the apostles and prophets. Okay, so they will be... Apostles and prophets are always going to be under revelation offices. So then they're going to be priests. They're going to be priests on the lowest level. Who scale. are not angels. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now, Revelation 22. Verse 9, we see how the angel divides the two positions from an earthly perspective. Mm. Then said he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, Sundulos. Sundulos means that we serve the same master. Out of that, he goes on to say, And <coughs> of thy brethren the prophets. Apostles, prophets, teachers fall into this category, the revelation offices. So the angel is saying, I'm generally <clears throat> the body of Christ just like you, and specifically I'm your brother because I come out of the family of apostles, prophets, and teachers. Those are going to be the, the angel priests. Right. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians 12. <clears throat> 28. God said, Some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now, in the after that, the sundulos, you have what I call the administrative offices. Those that can organize, those that can direct. Their calling is to give direction to men, organize men. This is what the kings will do in eternity. They direct, they organize, and they <coughs> basically are the <coughs> individuals that define how things operate. As a king would. Yes. As opposed to the teacher, the scholar, the instructor. So the Holy Spirit would fit the individual into the <coughs> office that would prepare him on earth with the, count, the talents that he needs to hone to put into operation in eternity. He's not going to call you to be an administrator if you're going to be a priest. You're not, the, you know, your calling is not to orchestrate, to direct your, your, your calling is to teach and instruct. And you'll find even the miracles and healings and helps are things that influence life. In influencing life, you direct. <clears throat> if you have the gift of healing, you're instructing an individual's health into his being and you have the ability at that point to direct well this is what you do to keep from this thing from coming back on you 
you're, you're affecting the life of the individual in such a way in which he is going to be <coughs> directed, instructed, or, well, organized, I'll put it that way. The uh, rulership of the, of the elders is organization, administration. The directive of the angel priests is instruction and teaching. So what we find, turn now to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Verse 10. And I fell on his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the brethren that the angel identifies with all have the spirit of prophecy prophecy, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God, which enables them to also to have custodianship over the book of Revelation. The elders do not have the spirit of prophecy. And in that respect, you can define, you can differentiate, starting here in this life, what category you fall into. Do you direct? Do you find that you feel comfortable in directing people, organizing people, administrating systems? Or do you feel comfortable in educating, instructing, enlightening? Whichever category you fall in, that's what you've been called to do from eternity. And it's going to d diverge out to becoming either an elder or a priest. <coughs> 